Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive methods of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. If you like the video, be sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you will be notified when future videos are posted. We also would appreciate it if you can make a tax-deductible donation to support our mission of providing stress-free dog education and resources. A link to donate is in the description below, along with links to our website and other resources to stress-free training. Enjoy the webinar. Hello, everyone. This is Deborah Ekman with your dog's friend. I hope that you're as excited about today's webinar as I am. Our speaker is Dr. Megan Ropsky. She is a resident in clinical behavior medicine, working with veterinary behaviorist, Dr. Amy Pike at the Animal Behavior Wellness Center in Fairfax. Before that, she was a surgical associate at Friendship Animal Hospital in Washington, DC. Dr. Ropsky became interested in veterinary behavior after she completed the fear-free certification program and started using fear-free methods at Friendship. She then realized that she could do more to improve the comfort of pets and their pet parents through a residency in veterinary behavior. I know that you will enjoy her webinar today. One other thing I'd like to remind you of is that we are a nonprofit and we do depend on donations for these free services. So if you are able to donate, we would appreciate it. You can go either to our webinars schedule page and you'll see donation icons there, or you can go to the top of our homepage and you'll see donations there. Our website is yourdogsfriend.org. Okay, I'm going to let Dr. Ropsky take over. Awesome. Thank you, Deborah, for that introduction. Really appreciate it. So as she said, I'm Dr. Ropsky, clinical behavior resident at our Fairfax location for the Animal Behavior Wellness Center. I'll have our contact info at the very end of the slide if you feel that you need to reach out with any questions or, or anything like that. The title for our topic today is Aging Dogs, What We Can Do to Preserve and Support Their Cognitive Health Through Their Golden Years. So we're going to be talking a lot about cognitive dysfunction syndrome, cognitive decline, and also some of the disease processes that can make diagnosing that a little bit difficult. A lot of our pups' conditions as they age can look similar. So we want to make sure that we know what we're looking at, what we're talking about. And then the very end, we're going to talk about some management, treatment strategies, and, and whatnot. I did want to give a small disclaimer when we're thinking about questions. So as our pets age, there are many medical conditions that can confound or make a diagnosis more difficult to reach. We wanna make sure that when we're asking questions, let's make them a bit more general and not so specific to your pet. Just keeping in mind that I can't diagnose your pet via a webinar. So if you ask a more specific question, I'm going to turn it a little bit more general just to make things a bit more easier for everyone that's watching. And then always think if you have any concerns about your pet's aging or any changes you're observing, always best move, contact your primary care veterinarian or anyone from the College of Veterinary Behavior in your area. So that can be a DACVB, so that's one of our boarded diplomates, or one of the residents in your area like me. And without further ado, let's get started with um, our presentation today. So let's talk about Cognitive Dysfunction Syndrome, or CDS. It's similar in many ways to human dementia, cognitive impairment, cognitive decline, and Alzheimer's disease. So what y'all are seeing there is the book that uh, Dr. Landsberg, another boarded veterinary behaviorist, wrote on canine and feline dementia. It was published in 2017. It's got about 200 pages, but this is something we're learning more and more about each day, each month. So let's think about a couple of questions. Are we more likely to observe this condition because our pets are living longer? 
are we as veterinarians more able to diagnose and sort of tease out this condition because we're learning more about it? Or are we as pet parents more able to recognize signs at home and then bring them to the attention of our veterinarian? The answer to all of those questions is yes. So our pups are aging, our pups are living longer, and we're seeing these, these changes happen. We as veterinarians know more, we know to ask more, and we as pet parents should be comfortable to bring those concerns to our veterinarian when we see them. So let's think about cognitive dysfunction and what that clinical picture looks like. So it's a progressive disease process. That means that it's not something that we can stop or revert back to a previous state, but we can potentially slow its progress. It's a neurodegenerative disease, which means that there's a breakdown of the components of the nervous system. So that can be parts of the brain, parts of the nerves, the connections that let those nerves talk to each other, and then their ability to talk to the rest of the body. We can certainly see behavior changes with cognitive dysfunction syndrome. The challenging thing is behavior conditions, behavior changes can be a first sign of cognitive dysfunction. They can also be a first sign of other medical diseases or primary behavior diseases in and of themselves. So it's important for us to be able to tease those out. Some of the main signs of CDS are impaired learning, memory, response to stimuli, and confusion. But what does CDS look like to us as pet parents? So we use an acronym that helps us to define the different categories that we're going to look at. That acronym is DISHA with two A's. So it's D-I-S-H-A-A. -A. And later on in the presentation, we're going to be looking at a way to track these different categories. It's a great tool from Purina that gives us a visual of all of those categories and how we can track them. So when we think about these different categories and what these acronym, this acronym stands for, D is disorientation, I is changes in social interaction. So that can be changes in interactions with human family members, animal family members, or even other animals that we have more frequent interactions with. We can also see a change in that sleep-wake cycle. We can see house soiling. We can see changes in anxiety, emergence of new types of anxiety. We can also see changes in activity. So is that an increase or a decrease in activity levels? We can also see other changes that aren't incorporated in that DISHA acronym. So we can see changes in cell hygiene. We can see changes in appetite and maybe response to stimuli. The biggest thing that we should be thinking of is ultimately these changes have an impact on the welfare of our pets, but also on the have an impact on that human animal bond as well. So why do we know so much about CDS? Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia in humans. Dementia is more of an umbrella term for loss of memory, loss of language, loss of problem solving abilities that can interfere with daily life. Aging dogs naturally develop Alzheimer's like changes in the brain. And that can be in addition to cognitive impairments that are similar to Alzheimer's disease progression. So they can potentially be a good model for us in the research realm to potentially evaluate therapies and interventions, not just for humans, but for dogs as well. We also extrapolate information from dogs into the cat realm as well. I know our focus is dogs today, but we certainly can think about this as a change for our kitty cats as well. When we think about this disease process, we want to think about, well, how do we measure those changes? What are we looking for? And those are our biomarker changes in disease progression. So we're going to get a little sciencey here, so bear with me. We'll make sure we explain all of it that way. So amyloid plaques can be deposited in the prefrontal cortex, the temporal cortex, the hippocampus, and the occipital cortex. That's a lot of information. Let me break it down for us. Amyloid plaques are protein deposits that cause nerve dysfunction. So the nerves aren't functioning as, as we would like. They also can cause loss of tissues within the nervous system and their ability to function together. And why do those four components of the brain matter? The prefrontal cortex is memory function. The temporal cortex creates and preserves long-term memory. The hippocampus is involved in learning and memory. And the occipital cortex is used for visual perception and processing. So what are we seeing and how do we process that? 
Think back to the signs that we see of cognitive impairment or cognitive dysfunction. A lot of them focus on learning and memory. Those structures within the brain have a big focus on learning and memory. So that's where we see those structures become very important, especially if these protein deposits are causing those nerves to not work as well as we would like them to. We can also see atrophy or loss of certain areas of the brain. So think about that brain being filled within the skull and then maybe it not being as filled and we see uh, less of that tissue being present. We can also think about other changes that cause this disease progression. So we can see degeneration or decreased function due to oxidative stress. That's caused by toxins and free radicals in the brain that should be filtered out by certain processes of the body. But as we age, those processes become less efficient. So we have more toxins percolating around in the brain and it makes it more challenging for our brain cells to communicate. We can also see specific changes in neurotransmitter systems. So we can see cholinergic decline. That's a decline in cognitive function, memory, learning, and emotional processing. Well, those are four of the keys to cognitive dysfunction syndrome. We can also see muscarinic decline, which is a decline in nerve excitability and plasticity. Nerve excitability is the ability for them to communicate together, to cause those electrical impulses, to let them talk to each other. And plasticity is their ability to adapt to change. As we age, that gets more complicated. We can also see a decline in the noradrenergic system, which is a decline in brain and body mobilization, arousal, and acute response to stress. This is where your fight or flight comes in. This is where we see, okay, maybe I'm not so active during the day. Maybe I'm a little bit sleepier because my arousal levels are lower. So all of these things come together to form that disease process that we know as cognitive decline or cognitive dysfunction. Now, you might say, wow, it sounds like every older dog could have cognitive dysfunction syndrome. And the challenge for us as veterinarians is CDS is the diagnosis of exclusion. So we have to rule out as confidently as possible all of these other medical components before we can clearly say, yes, this pup has a component of cognitive dysfunction that we need to be managing. As I alluded to before, CDS is confounded by other medical components and other medical conditions, meaning it's harder to diagnose because they mimic each other. They look very similar. And changes are underreported to our veterinarians. So veterinarians should be proactive in asking about aging pets, asking our pet parents about what those changes are that they're seeing. And pet parents should be comfortable to bring up the changes that they observe. A lot of times I think about it as, you know your pet best, you see those changes happening over time, whereas I might only be seeing your pet two to three times a year, you're seeing them on a daily basis and you see those changes. Let's talk about the prevalence of behavior signs in senior pets. And we're going to talk about a couple of studies that give us a little bit more information. We can think about two different categories of the signs that we see in our aging pets. So we might have a high prevalence, more common, but lower reporting by our pet parents. Think of those as our more subtle or milder signs. Those ones that we might say, oh, you know, Fluffy's just getting a little bit older. Maybe they're slowing down a bit. So they're not having such an impact on Fluffy's day-to-day -day life, but there may be subtler or more mild changes. Then we have these less common, lower prevalent signs, but they're more highly reported. So those are having a greater impact on our pet's well-being and on their interaction with their pet parents. So thinking about those two different categories and being a bit proactive in reporting the changes that we're seeing. So let's look at some science behind all of this. In a 2009 study, 270 dogs were looked at over seven years and they categorized their behavior problems. So I listed all of the data that they obtained from this study. So I broke it down into different categories of behavior problems. 32% of these dogs showed aggression to family members. 16% showed aggression to family members' dogs. 9% showed barking. 8% had separation anxiety. 6% had disorientation, another 6% had aggression to unfamiliar people, then we've got 5% of house soiling, 4% destruction, 4% had compulsive disorders, and 3% had noise fears. Now let's think back to those DISHA categories. 
And we can see where a lot of these can fit into those DISHA categories. So might we be already seeing some changes? So think about it. D, that's disorientation. Well, that's that 6% in the bottom of the first column. I, interactions, interactions with family members, interactions with dogs of the family. Well, those are those first two categories in that column. S is changes in sleep-wake cycle. Not necessarily a slam dunk, but if that barking is happening at night, there's your changing in your sleep-wake cycle. H is house soiling. Well, we've got that on the list. We've got anxiety. Okay, well, separation anxiety, that's definitely anxiety. Might that destruction be secondary to anxiety? Might noise fears be stemming from anxiety? The last one on our DISHA categories are activity. Less easy to find that in these categories, but it gives us an idea that as our pups age, might we be seeing some of those more subtle changes that we potentially need to be thinking of? Or are some of those changes actually associated with other anxiety disorders, other medical concerns? And we're going to tease that out a little bit moving forward. So if we look at some more data on the prevalence or how common these signs are in dogs. So when we look at a, a whole gamut of studies, so multiple reports from multiple studies, CDS can happen in 14 to up to 60% of dogs over eight years. So we would think of that as a bit middle-aged for some of our pups and we're already potentially seeing some signs. When we look at a study out of UC Davis in 2001, they separated dogs into different sets of age groups and then compared the signs that they saw to the DISHA categories and tried to see what number of categories did we see each pup have signs in. So pups that are 11 to 12 years, 28% had one DISHA category affected and 10% had two or more affected. So you might say, okay, Dr. Oski, that's not that many. Let's look at the next bullet point. 15 to 16 years of age, 68% had one DISHA category affected, and over a third had two or more DISHA categories affected. Well, that's a lot, and that's only a short four-year progression. When we look at the next bullet point, 22% of dogs that did not show signs when first evaluated did 12 to 18 months later. So that alludes to the progressive disease process we can see. And then look at that last bullet point, 48% with impairment in one category had impairment in two or more categories 12 to 18 months later. So it's that idea of if we're seeing change in one category, we might be more likely to see change in other categories moving forward. We also think about pet parents reporting. So in a study from Pfizer Animal Health in 1999, 48% of pet parents reported at least one sign in their pets age seven years or older, but only 17% told their veterinarian about it. So again, think back to it. Is it a lower, more subtle, more milder sign that maybe they thought, oh, natural aging process, don't have to worry about it? Or did their veterinarian not ask them about it? Did they not think they needed to bring it up? We don't necessarily know that answer, but it's that idea of, if almost 50% of my pet parents are seeing these signs, I want to know about it so I can help sooner rather than later. When we look at an additional study, they looked at dogs eight years or older with about 14% showing some sign of cognitive dysfunction. Only 13% of those 14% of dogs had actually been diagnosed. So again, that idea of that potential underreporting and underdiagnosing. So what can we do to help improve this? We have the best chance to slow decline in our aging pets if we identify these signs early. And how do we do that? Having our pets evaluated twice a year with medical behavioral health screenings and additional diagnostics and testing is going to be key to identifying in, the, in, in acting early and then being able to hopefully slow that progression down as much as we can. So most people might say, okay, well, the diagnosis must be easy to get to. There can't be that many things that could confound a diagnosis. So let's look at this. Not my goal for any of y'all to be able to read these, this image here, just to give you an idea of the extensive list that we have to go through when we see these various clinical signs. So it's the idea of, I'm seeing clinical signs, what medical diseases could I have to rule out? Could I have to rule out cognitive dysfunction? The first one is from our dementia book. 
there is an entire chapter on what could look like cognitive dysfunction. What do we have to rule out? So it's very important to think about what diseases might mimic changes in our older pets. So let's look at those. We can think about behavioral differentials, anxiety, fear, nighttime waking, vocalization, house soiling, aggression, repetitive behaviors, might they be compulsive disorders? Have to tease that out a bit. Let's think about the non-behavior concerns. We can think of sensory decline. Do our pups have cataracts that make it harder to see? Do they have lenticular sclerosis, which is the clouding of the eye that should not impair that vision? Might they have loss of vision in general? loss of hearing, loss of smell, all of that sensory decline can make it harder for me to navigate my environment or know where to go when we move things around the house. We can also see pain and musculoskeletal changes. So are those degenerative diseases seeing that change over time? Are we thinking about arthritis, muscular dystrophy, nerve conditions? We also they have to think about the cardiovascular system. So higher low blood pressure, primary heart disease? Do we have a heart murmur that indicates heart disease? Do we have anemia or lower red blood cell counts? If we think about other medical components, we can have endocrine disease. So think diabetes, pancreas disease or tumors, thyroid disease, adrenal disease or parathyroid disease. Those are little glands that live on the parathyroid or on the thyroid gland that regulate calcium balances. We can also have digestive concerns. Do we have dental disease, a tooth fracture? Are our gums inflamed? Is there a tumor in the mouth or along the gums? Is there liver disease, infection, inflammation, constipation, nutritional imbalances, or even something as simple as discomfort that causes a change in our dogs? Can we have diseases of the urinary tract? So kidney disease, infection, inflammation, stones in the kidney, the ureter, the bladder, urinary incontinence, kidney or bladder tumors, prostate disease or tumors if you're a male dog. We also think about primary neurologic concerns, brain tumors, spinal cord tumors, nerve tumors, infection, inflammation, seizures. We can also think about less specific disease processes or maybe even just clinical signs that we see, dehydration, loss of organ function, decreased immune system function, any type of cancer, weight loss, or even obesity or sleep loss. So in looking at that list, we can see how complicated getting to that diagnosis of cognitive dysfunction is, but also that exhaustive list of, well, I need to rule all of this out and at least look into it before I can at least key into that diagnosis. So when we came into this presentation, I would guess a lot of folks thought, okay, cognitive dysfunction, here's this nice little circle. And then when I think about the diagnostic tree or how do I get to that diagnosis, I see this. So it's a lot more complicated, a lot more detail we have to go into to figure out what's going on. And then it ends up looking like this a big jumble that can get really complicated. So that's why it's best to start early so that we can track those changes over time. Let's look at what a diagnostic workup could look like for our senior pets. So first on that list, physical exam that includes a thorough orthopedic exam. So looking at the joints and the muscles and the bones. Also doing a neurologic exam and an ophthalmic exam. So that's an exam of our eyes to make sure that they're functioning well. We also wanna have a discussion of behavior changes that we're seeing, whether they are more chronic and we're seeing an acute worsening or they're an acute change altogether and we need to look into that. Then we get into more of the blood testing. So we can look at a CBC in chemistry. Those are your basic blood values that are looking at red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, liver and kidney and electrolyte values. We can also think about thyroid testing, adrenal testing, looking at urine and feces to make sure that everything is working appropriately. We can also think about doing blood pressure to rule out high or low blood pressure. If we're seeing gastrointestinal signs, so nausea, vomiting, hypersalivation, not interested in food, might we think of some specifically GI, targeted blood work? 
Might we think about x-rays of the joints, x-rays of the chest to look for any spread of cancer or other disease processes. We might think about an abdominal ultrasound for the same reason. So looking at the organs within the belly to make sure that they all look appropriate and there's nothing concerning there. If there's a heart murmur, might we reach for an echocardiogram to make sure the heart is working in tip top shape. If there are any neurologic concerns, we might think about an MRI or a CT of the brain and spinal cord, or even testing of the fluid around the spinal cord to make sure there's not infection or inflammation. We might also think of endoscopy. So we're sending a little camera into our pup's mouth while they're under anesthesia, going into the stomach and the small intestine to get samples if there's a need for that. We might also think about Bayer testing. So that is brainstem auditory evoked response testing. That's testing our pup's hearing to see if there's hearing loss. So looking at this list, there's so much that we could have to go through to figure out what's going on with our pups. And that's why we think about making that appointment for that twice a year look to make sure that everything is working in tip top shape so that we can catch things before they become more severe. So diagnosis, management, and treatment of our primary medical concerns needs to happen first, because without that, it can be more difficult to accurately diagnose and manage and treat those behavior concerns. I will say in my aging pets, a lot of my owners will commonly ask about the role of pain. Also happens in my younger pets as well. So let's talk about that. What is the role of pain in all of this? As our pets age and as we, as pet parents age, discomfort can be a contributing factor to our anxiety and our level of irritability. Even if they become more irritable, they might be more likely to react, even with aggression to avoid that further discomfort. And remember, pain doesn't always have to be bone or joint related. Can it be from the GI, so stomach, intestines, anything in our belly, other organs, our back, our muscles, kidney, bladder, oral, dental pain, all of those things can cause an increase in our and our pet's irritability levels. Many folks will ask me, is my dog really in pain? They're moving okay. In a study of military working dogs, so those pups are getting vetted very frequently because of the jobs that they have to do, 47% had evidence of degenerative joint disease on x-rays, but they didn't show a lameness. So think about that. Almost half of these pups have evidence of joint disease, but they're not showing a lameness to their owners, their handlers. So does that mean that they're working through that pain? Does that mean that they have a higher pain tolerance? Or does that mean that they're just at least tolerating it as much as they can? And might there be something that pushes them over the edge? It's hard to say as each pup is an individual, but that number is pretty big. The CaneCog facility is a facility in Canada that does a lot of our cognitive research. So they have a big beagle population. When they look at their population and their notes, about 80% of those dogs have osteoarthritis. That's a big number. And then when we look at another study of adult dogs, 20% of all adult dogs have some degree of arthritis. So does that mean that some are lame? Yes. Does that mean that some don't show sign of lameness? Yes. But if there are that many that have osteoarthritis, could there be a component of pain that we need to worry about? So Dr. Mills is another behaviorist over from our European college. He and his colleagues published in 2020 a pain and problem behavior in cats and dogs report. So they looked at various behavior practices caseloads and they found that pain was suspected in 28 to 82 percent of all of those behavior cases that's a lot animals expressing pain may feel more at risk may express higher anxiety may have decreased access to resources due to their discomfort think about that i'm not going to stand up to go to that food bowl because my back hurts or my knee hurts we should not discount the potential role that pain plays in these cases so we have to think about treating suspected discomfort that should be done before that should be done first rather than waiting until behavior therapy fails to reach for that Whew. okay now that we've exhausted all the medical options let's focus on cds so we talked about that DISHA acronym. This graphic is from the DISHA form that anyone can access from the Purina Institute. Go to your search engine of choice, put in DISHA with two A's and then Purina Institute, and you'll get access to a PDF. 
I send it out to my clients all of the time, but you can access it on your own. What they did is they took each one of those different categories and then listed some things for our pet parents to look at. We're gonna look at all of them and we're grading them on a scale of zero to three. Zero means not present, three means severe. And then you add up all of those categories and get your total. And then you get put into a mild, moderate or severe category based on the clinical signs that we're seeing. So let's dive right in. Disorientation. So this is confusion, that makes sense. This can also be not being able to maneuver around objects or obstacles or even over them. So this can be getting stuck, having difficulty around objects. And one of the things that I talk to my pet parents about a lot is our pups might go to the hinge side of the door. So instead of going to the doorknob side, they go to the hinge side. So think about that. I'm confused as to which side of the door opens. They might stare blankly into space. So is that at walls, at floors? They might not recognize familiar people, familiar pets. Do they get lost in the yard or in the home? And are they less reactive to visual, so sight stimuli or sound stimuli? So maybe they were reactive before, but now they don't react as much or seem confused by those stimuli. If we talk about social interactions, this can be a decrease or an increase in social interaction based on your pup's behavior before. They might show a new fear or avoidance or aggression. They might have decreased tolerance of handling or husbandry procedures. So think about nail trims, bathing, ear cleaning. Those types of things might be more challenging for our pups. So think about being more irritable, fearful, aggressive with visitors, family or other animals. Maybe they have a decreased interest in approaching or getting pet or having that type of interaction. So that change in their social interaction with the people within that household. Next, we're looking at sleep wake cycle. So we can see increased daytime sleep, decreased activity during the day. And that turns into, I am up at night. I'm restless at night. I have pacing, sleeping less. And then some will have vocalization at night. That's actually a pretty common one that I, I talk about with my clients. It's something we can see pretty commonly. And that gets back to that level of arousal that we talked about with that noradrenergic system, that idea of arousal being decreased. I might be more sleepy during the day and more active at night. We can think about house soiling, learning, and memory together. So indoor soiling can take place in sleeping areas or the crate. It's important to distinguish this from urinary incontinence. So that's something that we have to tease out as a veterinarian. We can also see indoor soiling in the view of the pet parent, or our pups might go outside, not eliminate, and then come back inside and eliminate on their return. It's that idea of, am I losing that ability to remember what house training was and what that looked like for our pups? We can also find that they're less able to learn new tasks and respond to previously learned cues. Again, think about that. Can that be that my learning and memory is decreased? Or are you asking me for a sit and my hips hurt and I can't? Or are you asking me for a sit and my hearing is less? So that idea of all of those things can come together. We can also think of difficulty getting our pup's attention, increased distractions, and decreased focus as we move through that process. When we think about activity levels, this can be increased restlessness, this can be decreased activity, maybe a bit of depression, staring or fixating at other objects, snapping at those objects, vocalization, whining. Some pups will have an increased activity level that actually translates to self-trauma. So might they be licking their arms or might they be licking their paws more? We can also think about that anxiety category, so anxiety and agitation, so inappropriate vocalizations. Think of those pups that are, are barking at night, or are they barking at seemingly nothing when they're staring off into space? Might we see increased irritability, restlessness, or agitation? So all of those DISHA items get a number, and then we total that item at the very at those numbers at the very end and get our total and we get put into that mild, moderate or severe category. 
Non-DISHA items that we should also be thinking of are changing in grooming behavior, increased speed or volume of eating, maybe a decreased interest in eating. Do we see an altered response to various stimuli? So sight, sound, maybe even smell. Now that we know what to look for, how to quantify and track those signs, let's talk about therapy and intervention. This is the fun part. So let's think about different things that we can do to help our pups as they age. So we wanna think about household management and modifications. We'll talk about supplements. We'll talk about diets that are available to our aging pets. We'll talk about environmental enrichment, behavioral enrichment, and then we're gonna to touch briefly on medications that might be available to our pups if appropriate. When we think about household management and modifications, these pups as they age, helpful for them to have a stimulating yet predictable routine. We want that stimulation to occur during the day so that they have things to do during their waking hours and then they're able to rest and get that restful sleep at night. We want to reinforce those desirable behaviors while keeping in mind what our pups limitations might be as they age. So I know a lot of folks, our go-to cue is SIT, please sit for this, that, and the other thing. But if our pups have hips that are maybe a bit uncomfortable, might we not be able to ask for that sit? Might we ask for a touch cue or a hand target instead? Might we ask for them to target another object or maybe not asking them for that full sit? Maybe we ask them for a paw or whatever is limiting your pup. We want to make sure that we're keeping track of that limitation so that we're not asking them to do something that they can't do or become frustrated because they can't do it. We want to can discontinue all forms of punishment. So I might think about this more for my pup that's maybe soiling within the house. Not gonna do us as pet parents any good or our pets any good to punish that behavior. We have to think about what that aging process looks like. What can we do to best help our pets in those situations so that we don't have to reach for that punishment or that aversive technique. Maybe we need to make more frequent trips to the outdoors. If I'm working during the day, do I think about getting a dog walker because my pup can't last that entire eight hour day without having to go potty? Or do we think about an elimination site indoors? So there are various potty patches that we can have inside that allows our pet to relieve themselves if maybe we're not able to. We can think about ramps and other physical support devices, non-slip surfaces. So whether that be something that we put on the ground itself, whether that be carpeting, whether that be other affixing non-slip surfaces or various products that could go onto the pups, either pads or a little booty to help them gain a little bit more traction there. Biggest thing to think of when we're thinking about household changes, we want to make them gradually no abrupt change that could make things more challenging for our pups. So let's look at a couple of examples. So we think about different ramps and other devices to help our pups as they move around. So think about that golden retriever that maybe, yeah, they used to be able to jump into the cargo area of the SUV, but it's a little bit harder now. Well, this is a foldable uh, ramp that you can quite literally just have in the back seat of the SUV and be ready to go. Our more little guys think about jumping up and down off of the bed, off of the couch. If that's a little bit more challenging for them, well, let's think about a ramp option so that they can still access those places that they enjoy, but let's make it a little bit easier for them. If we need to think about things from a mobility and walk standpoint, there are various harnesses that are available to us to help our pups as they age. So the woman in the blue shirt, that's the help M up harness. So I put the name there because that's uh, sometimes a little bit confusing to figure out what those words are there. So what it is, is it's a harness with multiple attachment points and a handle that helps our pups be able to move around while we're able to support them. What's nice is that back portion has a male and female version so we can appropriately manage our dog's elimination needs and I like this one because it does have that sort of walking strap walking leash I'm a smaller person so it's helpful for me if I was able to pick my dog up and help them move a bit Another option is the rough wear line of harnesses. They are more for those pups that are going out on mountain hikes and things like that. But I really like them because they have those similar multiple points of attachment and they've got those handles. I've used these guys pretty commonly for 
um, dogs that have orthopedic surgery and maybe need a little bit more stability in that regard. So there's a couple of different options based on how much support your pup needs, but great options to think of purely because that handle, that ability to move our pup around a bit more helps them get around and get to the things that they like to do. We also have to think about modification of our human behaviors. So that old adage, let sleeping dogs lie. If a dog is lying down, we want to make sure we're not approaching them. And that's true for our older pups and for our younger pups as well. We want to encourage our pups to come to us if they're comfortable. Again, think about that. If I'm asking you to come towards me and you're uncomfortable, your hips hurt, your knees hurt, you're just not feeling it. Well, you can stay on your bed and I'm not going to pressure you to come and engage with me. We also have to think about that startle response for our dogs. Think about it. If my sense of hearing isn't as good as it used to be, might I be more startled if somebody walks up behind me? So might we think about calling their name from afar to let them know that we're coming? Might we put a treat under their nose to let them know, hey, I'm here. You don't have to be worried. We also want to make sure that we're increasing the supervision of young children to avoid conflict. Think about this scenario. We've got a young child in the family. We got them a puppy when they were younger and that puppy is starting to grow up as our child is growing. Once our child reaches their teenage years, that pup's gonna be a bit older. They're gonna be into this category of, maybe I'm a little bit more uncomfortable. Maybe I don't want to play as much or as rough as you want. Maybe I just don't want that interaction and I'm tired at the end of the day. So we wanna make sure that we're all advocating for our pups and for our kids as well to make sure that everyone is as safe as possible. Might that look like a movable exercise pen around the place that our older dog sleeps and having an area where they can avoid that disturbance? Does that maybe look like a rule for the household when Fluffy is laying here, we don't bother him or her? Let's talk about supplements and things that we can give our pups to at least help decrease and delay that process. So Senalife is a product from Steva Animal Health. It's got a couple of components that help to manage those various nerve changes that we can see and help protect our cells as much as possible. So phosphatidylserine, it's a cell membrane component. It facilitates neuronal signaling, so that's the nerves talking to each other, and cholinergic transmission. Think memory, think learning. It's also got ginkgo biloba, vitamin E, and resveratrol. Those are antioxidants. So think about decreasing toxins, decreasing free radicals, and vitamin B6, which has a neuroprotective effect. This comes in two sizes, small dog and large dog. We can also think about supplements like SAM-E. So that's S, adenosyl methionine, helps to maintain cell fluidity and function. So the cells aren't stiff, but they're more fluid as they're moving through. Helps to regulate neurotransmitter levels, increase glutathione, which is another antioxidant property. So decreasing those toxins, those free radicals. It's shown improvement in clinical signs in clinical trials. You've got NovaFit from Verbac, which is harder to find and has been on back order periodically, but that's what our main studies were, were done on. We've also got Denimarin Advanced from Nutramax, so that's a great option for our older pups. We can also think about things from a diet standpoint. So there's a couple that we can talk about. So Hills has an option. It's a prescription diet, so it's BD. It improves antioxidant defense, enhances mitochondrial function, which is the part of the cell that produces energy. And the highest scores that they saw in our aging pups was when diet was included with enrichment. And that was done in Beagles. Purina Pro Plan has Bright Mind, which is not prescription. It has medium chain triglycerides as an alternative energy source for our neurons or our nerve cells. They showed a better performance over an eight month period. Now the prescription version from Purina is the Purina Pro Plan Veterinary Diet NeuroCare. So again, it has those medium chain triglycerides and a brain protection blend. And they showed improvement specifically in those DISHA categories over a three month period. Wanted to give you guys a visual of what those look like. What's nice is the Purina Bright Mind has a large breed and small breed formula. So you can at least manage that based on your pup's size. We can also think of different adjunctive therapies, so adding things on. Adaptyl is the canine appeasing pheromone from SIVA, can help to decrease fear and anxiety. 
We might think about the hepato true benefits. They're from veterinary recommended solutions. Again, that's adding in that glutathione for its antioxidant properties. So decreasing toxins, decreasing free radicals. We can also think about fish oils containing DHA and EPA for their anti-inflammatory effects. When we think about environmental and behavioral enrichment, we think about if you don't use it, you lose it. So think about how we as humans will do our crossword puzzles or our Sudoku puzzles when we get the newspaper. Our pups need that as well. So Milgram et al. in 2004 showed that continuing enrichment via play, training, exercise, new toys can help to maintain that cognitive dysfunction and slow that decline. We might have to think about alternative activities based on our pet's limitations. So is that shorter walks, stationary tug, find it, other reward-based training? Might we think about food manipulation toys? Always think about chew toys and maybe needing something that's softer or more easily chewed, especially if we have any concern for dental health. Might we think about using sound, visual, and smell cues for known behavior? To give you guys a great example, Think about asking your pup for a sit. You might use your voice, but what if your dog's hearing is decreased? Might it be helpful to also have a visual cue and give both of those together so they know exactly what we want from that cue? We can also think about providing other outside opportunities. Maybe my pet can't go on a long hike, but they're happy to meander around the yard instead. We want to encourage sniffing, scent work, nose work. We want to think about more time spent awake and engaged during those daily hours so that they are more likely to sleep and get that restful sleep at night. We might also think about creating a safe haven for that pup to spend quality time in, reducing anxiety, reducing confusion. I know I can go to this place and it'll be safe. Let's look at a couple of examples. So the one on the top with the uh, older looking beagle, that's our traditional snuffle mat. So definitely a lot of variations out there, but something that is pretty easy for our pet parents and for our pups to do, engaging all of those senses. Just below that is our blue maize food bowl. So definitely a great option. You can think about using that for dry food, freezing food, making it more exciting. Some other options we can think of for food dispensing toys, the purple one in the middle is a busy buddy. The one below that is a topple, so it's T-O-P-P-L. I like those because the mouth is a little bit wider than your typical Kong. So if our pups are having some challenges, that wider mouth might make things a little bit easier for them. The orange one in the top corner is the Tricky Treat Ball. And then Kong has a senior product that's a little bit less uh, challenging for our older pets to maneuver. So it's easier on their teeth and their gums. Let's talk briefly about medication options. Might not be right for all of our pets, but it's certainly something we can think of. So Selegiline or Anapril is the only approved pharmaceutical in North America. It's an MAOB inhibitor. So it irreversibly binds to this enzyme, monoamine oxidase B. What it does is it works to improve mood and attention. It enhances dopamine, which is our pleasure chemical. It enhances catecholamine function. It decreases free radicals. So think about decreasing those toxins, antioxidants. We can also think about an increase in the release and decrease in the reuptake of norepinephrine which is what manages our arousal response, has some possible neuroprotective effects on neurons. We do have some data behind that. So that is when we look at the Campbell study from 2001, had some placebo controlled trials. So that's where we take the medication and we have dogs that had no medication on board. Improvement in 77% of dogs at day 60. We see that their activity and sleep-wake cycle is improved in 67% of our cases. And we can see that disorientation and confusion improvement in 78% of our cases. So that's definitely some really great improvement and some great numbers there for sure. We can also think about additional anxiolytics. So anti-anxiety medications can be considered if there is anxiety, agitation, irritability that we can potentially manage, nighttime waking, even some house soiling. So thinking about teasing out what those behavior concerns might be and do we need a little bit more oomph, if you will. 
the challenges that we can encounter as our dogs age, it can be challenging for them to learn new tasks that can be more difficult. They're less able to adapt to change. So again, thinking about slowing down and doing those house changes, those management strategies incrementally. Medical conditions, again, can make treating behavior concerns more difficult. Think about that exhaustive list that we had to look through to see what we needed to rule in, rule out. Medical conditions can make or make learning or prevent learning, make learning more difficult. Think about the impracticality of asking a dog to sit if their hips hurt or their knees hurt. Well, I've got to change the game up and think about something different to have them do instead. Also think about that sensory loss, that idea of if my pup can't hear me, might I need to think about a different cue for them so they know exactly what I'm asking. Interventions can be less successful with time due to that natural aging process. So even if we catch these pups early, might we find that those interventions are less successful as our pups age during that natural aging process. Age, quality of life, and pet parent finances can also play a role in the diagnostics and therapeutics that we choose and pursue. Prognosis can be variable depending upon those complicating medical factors. It's poorer if a medical cause cannot be resolved or treated or even identified. Improvement is when we see greater improvement with improved pet parent compliance, but we also have to think about CDS can be a progressive disease, even if our pup doesn't have that diagnosis of CDS, but they're still having that natural aging process, it can be a progressive disease that we have to think of. So some really helpful resources for my pet parents out there. Decoding Your Dog is the uh, publication from the veterinary behaviorists, those boarded diplomates. So they uh, wrote that book. There's a lot of different chapters, but the very last chapter is completely focused on our pups as they age. So really great resource for any of my pup owners out there. Remember Me is a book that is specifically focused on pups with cognitive dysfunction. So great options, both of them available on Amazon. We can also think about different websites to explore, and we can certainly, um, I can send these to Deborah so that she has them and can send them out to y'all as well. So dogdementia.com is a very helpful resource. There is also a Facebook group if anyone is interested in that. So there's a group for canine cognitive dysfunction. So a great place to chat or to share stories and, and things like that. So really some really helpful options for us. We have reached the end of my slide set. So I want to thank everyone for attending here in person and virtually. I know it's a beautiful Saturday out there, so I really appreciate everyone who came and attended in person. Again, one thing I want to touch on is if you're at all concerned about your senior pet's health, contact your primary care veterinarian. Think about all of those things that we need to think about, rule out, diagnose. Always best to contact them first. And then if you need to, always welcome to reach out to the ABWC. Our website is there and I know that it's in your uh, orientation email as well. So abwellnesscenter.com. You can also contact any boarded diplomate in your area. So that is the DACVB or any of your residents in the area as well. There is a plethora of us. So we are for sure here to help. And I would say, Deborah, I know we wanted to turn it over to questions. Do you want me to handle my two questions that we got ahead of time first and then reach out yeah. to the chat after yeah. that? One of them actually came in chat as well. So go ahead and start with those two. Perfect. Perfect. So the first one that we had that was sent over via email was asking about pups food interest and interest in food as they aged and almost that idea of some of our pups will go over to that food bowl, seem interested, but then not want to eat or I can't get them interested in eating. And so I would say first and foremost, rule out medical concerns. So what I would think of is I'll give you the short list. Is there something going on in the mouth? Do my teeth hurt? Or do my gums hurt? Am I nauseous? Is there something that tells me, yeah, you don't want to eat this because remember how it made you not feel good last time? Do I need to rule out that medical component? Also think about something from a pain standpoint. Does it hurt to put my head down to that bowl? Do I need to lift that bowl up a bit because there could be some discomfort in our neck or in our shoulders? 
or even discomfort in their belly? Is that why they're going to the food bowl? I'm interested, uh, but I can't eat because my belly hurts when I do. Once we rule out that medical component, some of the things that I will think of for my pups to almost entice them to eat a bit, I think about microwaving food. I think about gravy toppers. Do I need to change the consistency of the food to entice them a little bit more? Might I think about how do I reinforce your approach to the bowl and you eating? So something that can be very helpful for our pups is you've come up to the bowl, you've eaten a couple bites, oh wow, piece of cheese stick just appeared in your bowl or a piece of hot dog appeared in that bowl. I'm reinforcing that dog for eating their normal kibble and not necessarily putting on a bunch of toppers that they kind of can just eat right off of the top. So I'm reinforcing that behavior that I want to see. Some of my pups might benefit from an appetite stimulant. So there are definitely a couple of different ones out on the market. That would be a question for your veterinarian in that regard. So might be an option that some of my older pets need to think of. And then the other question that we get commonly, we get it ahead of time. Everyone's talking about CBD and hemp and those types of products. What I will say is, Right now, at least with the studies that we have, there are more and more coming out all of the time. We have more information from a pain standpoint than we do from other standpoints in veterinary medicine. So sure, if there is a pain component that I need to manage, might that be a product that I think of? It's certainly possible. I will say that I've had some pups that have a benefit of using that type of a product at night. Not everyone benefits from it, but it's certainly something that your vet might recommend. I would say if you're wanting more information on CBD, I'm going to plug Dr. Sin's lecture that she recorded through Your Dog's Friend all about CBD and those products. So I would say use that resource and talk to your veterinarian if it's something that could be worthwhile for your pup as they age. Okay, Deborah, I am ready for questions. Okay. Yeah. The first one from Julie is that she has a 12 year old cabochon that still acts like a puppy. Should she be worried? Hmm. Honestly, that, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I would say if your pup is doing well, comfortable, moving around well, eating well, and is enjoying life, I would say that's not something that I would have as a red flag. Oh my gosh, we need to do something about it always something that we want to track over time. So if there's a change that we see, might I be a bit more concerned? But I would say, just as humans age differently, might our pups age differently as well? And if your pup is still moving around and happy and healthy, good for you. Okay, another question is, when a dog has a stroke, can that mimic cognitive dysfunction? Great question, and I would say, it's certainly possible. I would say it depends on what part of the brain is affected. So that idea of when we have a stroke, certain parts of the brain might be affected. And so if a part of the brain that was involved in learning and memory was affected, sure. If there was a part of the brain that was affected that uses long-term memory, certainly could we see signs of cognitive dysfunction? Yes. I would say with something like that, that would be one where I would reach for more of my general tips and tricks as far as supplements and environmental enrichment and management to help that pup, especially if they had any physical challenges as they moved forward. But I would say it's certainly possible. Might we not have the research and the data behind it? That's where I'm edging more on the it's possible. Okay. Where can you find a vet who specializes in geriatrics? Mm, huh, I would say harder to find someone that has a specific specialty in it. We don't necessarily have like we do in human medicine, those folks that specialize in our older pets in particular. What I would say is your primary care veterinarian should have some comfortability in managing pets as they age. I would also say that our boarded behaviorists and the associated residents, we have a greater comfortability with that, but we're certainly going to work with your primary care veterinarian as well with anything that we recommend. So not necessarily would I say 
boarded behaviorists and residents are your go-to for your aging pets, but we could certainly be a helpful place to start while working in concert with your primary care veterinarian. I've got certainly primary care veterinarians who really like working with our older pet population, but it's not necessarily a specialty that we have as we do in human medicine. I hope that answers that question. Okay. Um, another question is, and, and this one is actually my question. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, how, how aware are the dogs of their own decline and are they unhappy watching their abilities diminish? Honestly, it's, it's a great question. And I would say it's harder for us to quantify what our pets are feeling. I would say, I think about it from a standpoint of, do I see increased frustration with my pups and their inability to do X, Y, or Z? So that idea of, great example, my pup can't get up the stairs to get to that sleeping spot on the bed in the sun in the afternoon that they really love. Might I see some increased frustration in that pup not being able to do that? Possibly. If I do, let me manage that environment. Do I put a little ramp on that stair so that they don't have to go up each individual stair and they can go up that stairwell? What I would say is some of my pups, so think about those that have an increase in anxiety. Might that increase in anxiety stem from I'm anxious about doing X, Y, or Z, or I'm anxious about engaging in this behavior and then my anxiety increases. So in that sense, might I see that they're more sensitive to that decline? Might I also have some pups that say, you know what, if I sleep on this bed and you bring me my food every day, I'm okay with that and I can manage. What I would say is the best thing that I recommend for any of my pet parents with aging pets, I think about keeping a calendar of good days and bad days. And I also think about making a list of the things that your pup enjoys. So for my Sadie, who you see in that picture there, she's only six. So she's not, she's not in our, our older gal category, but I would say things that she loves eating, laying on the bed. She's probably laying in the bedroom behind me here, laying on the bed in the sun, looking out the window, playing with her toys and running around in the yard. So all of those things, as she ages, I'm going to keep an eye on them and see if she's still able to do them. And if she isn't, does that cause her an increase in her frustration and anxiety? And I'm going to keep track of that on a calendar to see what those good days and bad days look like. Yeah. Okay. Um, if an aging dog won't go out the front anymore, but will go out back, should the person try to persuade the dog to go out the front? Great question. Great question. And I would say that one might be a little bit more of a complicated answer. So I would say, am I not going out the front door because I am fearful or anxious of that threshold? Is there something outside in the front yard that caused me to be fearful or anxious? Also think about the, at least the dynamics, the mechanics of those different exits. Does the front yard have steps and they're more challenging? Is the backyard or the back door straight out to the yard? Are those differences? I would say if that pup is more comfortable with the backyard and it's easily accessible and easily usable, I would say use that backyard to not cause any increase in stress, anxiety, if there's anything associated with that front area. If we needed to, so say the backyard is more challenging for my humans to get to, and I needed to use that front door, there are certainly some ways that we could potentially manage it. Do I bring in that positive reinforcement training technique and work with one of my positive reinforcement trainers? It's possible. We still might run into the scenario where that pup says, you could put filet mignon under my nose and I cannot possibly go through that front door. And if that happens, I would say, use that back door if you're able to, just making it easier for everyone involved in that situation. Okay. Yeah. Um, this was partially answered by another participant, but- gotcha. We wanted to know what if your dog is terrified of ramps or steps mm, yes that that the old let me help you but now you're afraid of the thing that i've purchased to to help you what i would say in that situation is i'm always going to be bring food 
into it. And I'm going to think about a desensitization and counter conditioning process to that ramp or that step, that idea of how do I do things in slow, teeny tiny increments to improve your comfortability. And again, that might be one where you say, who is a positive reinforcement trainer that is in my area that could help me through that process? Purely because we can certainly go down that path of increasing fear if we do something too quickly. And I want to make sure that we are all set up for success. But yeah, it, it can certainly be challenging helping our pups to use the thing that we know can help them and improve their comfortability for sure. Okay. Um, Lillianne wants to know, would any of these supplements have an adverse effect on medications that the dog is already taking? Oh, great question. Great question. And I would say, ideally, they shouldn't. I have some pups that are on the gamut of everything and they're on a bunch of different medications for other disease processes. So I would say ideally not. Give you an example of the um, Denimarin Advanced. So that's the SAMe product. Not only is it used for dogs with cognitive dysfunction, but it's also used for pups that have liver concerns. So at least in that regard, it shouldn't. I will say out of all of the things we've talked about, the selegiline, that medication at the very end, that is the kiddo that doesn't really play well with others. So that can be more challenging if we add it onto a medication regimen. That's where I would say it's prescription anyway. You're going to be talking to your veterinarian regardless. Now, with that being said, do I have some pups that do not do well with those supplements? Sure. I've got one pup that every time we've tried to add in the Senna Life, they throw up every single time, no matter what. And I cannot get that. I, I cannot get that buy-in to use a supplement if my pup is going to be vomiting. I've got some pups that will not take a supplement regardless of how many times we try it. So there are definitely some pups that might have interactions. I would say if we're thinking about starting that supplement and your pup is on medications, always a good idea to have that chat with your veterinarian to say, do I need to be worried? Do I need to alter any doses? Do I need to make modifications? Also gives your veterinarian an idea of what you're thinking of, of wanting to ask about adding in so that we can keep all of our, our lists of medications and supplements up to date. Next question. How yeah. do you feel about melatonin for a dog that vocalizes at night? I would say favorably, as long as there's nothing else that I need to be worried about. So I would say sometimes I will add in melatonin for my pups that are waking at night, vocalizing at night. I have layered it on with other supplements. I've layered it on with other medications. I will say I always express caution in anything that's going to make my animals more sleepy because some of my owners are a bit more sensitive to that sedation though I very much hear my owners that are saying, but if we want them to sleep at night, might that be possible? So I would say always a good idea to talk to your veterinarian about adding something like that in. They can talk to you about safe doses and what to reach for from that human shelf there. But it's definitely something that I have added in on occasion for my pups that have nighttime challenges. Yeah. Mimi wants to know if excessive panting can be a sign of canine dysfunction. I would say it's canine possible. Dementia, sorry. <laughs> You're fine, Deborah. Don't even worry about it. I would say, Mimi, it's possible. Panting can be one of my more general signs where I have to sort of look through the weeds to figure out what that cause is. So I also think about panting from a stress, anxiety, pain and discomfort standpoint, or maybe I can't get into a position that's comfortable for me. So I would say, is it possible? Yes, but might there be another component that I need to suss out? So if you're finding that your pup is panting a fair amount or more than expected, or I'm thinking the AC is on or it's cold outside and you aren't hot and there's no reason for you to be panting, I would say, bring that concern up to your primary care veterinarian to make sure there's nothing going on that we need to be worried about more so than increased stress and anxiety and then talk to them about that. 
Is there independent scientific evidence supporting the use of Purina and the other specialty dog foods? Oh, goodness gracious. That is a great question. And what I would say, Deborah, why don't you, if you're able to, grab yeah. that grab that person's contact info and let me do a little bit of research because it's not on the tip of my tongue, but I know that there are studies but they might have come from that particular uh, manufacturer. So let me, if you're able to, grab that person's contact info and let me do a little bit of research and get back to them just because I don't want to say yes or no without knowing that answer. And Susan, you could help me do that by emailing administrator at your dog's And that way I won't go through a whole list of people looking for you. Okay. And I wrote a note down to Deborah as well to do my research okay. and get back to you. So yeah, okay. we'll, we'll both keep track of that. <laughs> All right. Um, Elizabeth wants to know if an older dog sleeps more during the day than when they were younger, but still sleeps fine at night, is that still concerning or is it more about whether it disturbs their nighttime sleep schedule? That's a great question. And I would say, I expect as our pups age for them to sleep more. So I would say as long as we are not seeing a change in their nighttime sleeping or seeing a change in their ability to sleep for lengths of time. So what I mean in that is my pups that are able to sleep through the night, that's awesome. But if they are not sleeping through the night, they're waking up more, they're having to readjust more, they can't get comfortable comfortable, that gets me concerned. But I would certainly say as my pups age, I expect them to be sleeping a bit more during the day. But I would think about those times that they're up and awake, engaging with their pet parents. If that is one where you still see their personality, you still see that enjoyment, I get less concerned about that increase in sleep during the day, as long as it's not affecting their nighttime sleep. Might be normal aging process. Here's something we haven't talked much about. Um, twice yearly physicals are almost impossible, even once yearly, with reactive older rescues who are not fond of having blood pressure checked and being touched. Yes. But what do you do with these older reactive dogs? Yeah, what I would do in those situations, and I think it depends on what protocol you already have in place for your pup, might that be one where we say, okay, twice a year. I don't know if I can, I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if that'll cut it. Let's do everything in our once a year exam. And does that mean that I reach for pre-visit pharmaceuticals, medications to manage that stress and anxiety ahead of time? Do I reach for safer, reversible, injectable sedation to say, we are going to do our exam this one time once a year, and we're going to do all of these things and have that plan in place so that we know exactly what blood work we want to get. Do we want to do x-rays? Do we want to do this, that, and the other thing? And that can also be one where my reactive dog parents really help me out where they will say, get videos of their dogs moving around in the yard off leash or, or on leash during walks and things like that so that I can assess that pup's gait before they get to the vet visit and they're concerned and worried. And I have my reactive dog parents, I find, are very good at giving me all of the details of all of the things that they are worried about, especially when I might not be able to assess those directly unless my pup is sedated if they are that reactive. So I would say that twice a year for the gamut of things is ideal, but we have to make modifications, again, based on the limitations of our pet. So might that be that conversation with your primary care vet of, how do we accomplish everything that my pet needs while taking into account their emotions as well? It probably also helps if your vet is a certified fear-free vet. I would say that definitely that definitely helps because they are very much able to manage those, those pups a bit better for sure. And easiest way to figure out if there's a fear-free vet in your area, you can go to uh, the fear-free website 
And Deborah, we can always include this in the chat as well. So fearfreepets.com. And then they've got a little search engine where you can quite literally put in your zip code and find a fear free vet in your area. So that would be definitely something good to think about. Good call on that, Deborah. Um, Jennifer's question is similar to the one I asked, and it's whether dogs are aware of what's happening to them with CDS uh, mm -hmm. and do the symptoms cause them distress? And again, I think. I would say it's it's hard to say. I would say that, again, that idea of increased frustration, increased anxiety, could that be their way of showing us that it is a bit distressing or it is a bit challenging? Or I'm thinking about if, say, my pup's mobility is decreased and they can't get their paws under them to move well, might that be distressing to them? So I would say it's harder for me to pinpoint, yes, this is exactly what we can look for to see our pets are distressed as they're aging. But I would say looking for those more subtle signs of anxiety, frustration would be at least a good key in to say, okay, maybe I need to modify. Maybe I as pet parent need to alter what we're doing to help you be successful. When I asked the question, I was thinking of a dog that I had who, as he got older, would walk in circles when he was trying to find the door and couldn't. Yeah. And yeah. I always assumed that he must know, but maybe he didn't. Yeah, it's, it's that idea of if that, if that learning, if that part of his memory had started to deteriorate and he didn't know where that door was or could I not orient myself to that door or was there something else causing me distress where my only way to cope is to pace in that circle that idea of restlessness that increased anxiety it's certainly there again it's that idea of there are combinations of things that we have to think of it's not so clear cut yeah, it was difficult to watch, though. It's hard to be the human. Very it. much so. I would I would agree with you. It's hard to be the human, especially in these situations where I will do anything that you need me to do. But sometimes I don't know where to start and what's needed and what isn't. And when your signs continue to progress, it can certainly be heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, what are the conditions and medications that might make selegaline? contraindicated for a dog? Yeah, so I would say the, the big sort of ballpark, if I put a big ballpark disclaimer on it, I'm gonna say anything that affects serotonin, so your SSRI, so I mean, that could be example, fluoxetine or Prozac. I would say I use caution with my pups that are on trazodone, or tramadol. Those are sort of my big, the big things, at least in my profession, <laughs> that I think of that can cause, um, that can be contraindicated. There are certainly some other ones on, on that list that I use less frequently that I always have to reach for my drug book if I've got a patient on it and I'm thinking about selegiline. But I would say biggest thing that I think of is anything that affects serotonin, I'm gonna be cautious. Kim wants to know the effects of vaccines on senior dogs. Mm, great question. And I would say, as we do say studies on vaccines, we, I would say it's not necessarily one where I can say for certain, if you give this vaccine, you need to be worried about X, Y, or Z in our senior dogs. I would say that's a conversation that I reach out to my primary care vets for to say, as our pups age, how frequently do we need to be giving these vaccines? Obviously, rabies, required for your registration, required by law to have that. So that's important. But that idea of frequency of vaccines as our pups age is a great question for your primary care veterinarian. Knowing that our pups are getting older, do I need to be vaccinating as frequently as, as I used to? And I will quite, I will quite honestly tell you, I have my own primary care vet for my dogs and I would defer to them for that question if I had it myself. So that's where I would say, talking to your primary care veterinarian is gonna be best for that. I have not vaccinated my own pets personally in many years. I have other veterinarians do that for me. So yeah. How do you feel about titers? 
Huh. I would say that it's helpful for some of my pets that maybe have vaccine reactions or they're more sensitive to vaccines. I would say that at least in, in my profession and in my previous life in surgery, I never did it, but I do know that there are primary care vets that will reach for that. I would also say it depends on what your dog's comfortability with a blood draw is, because if they're not comfortable, then maybe a quick vaccine is better than a blood draw for a titer. Yeah. Okay. And can you just in, in two words explain what a titer is for people who don't know? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I should have done that from the beginning. So a titer is where you basically will draw a patient's blood, send that blood off to a lab to assess what their response to a previous vaccine was. So to give you an example from human life, because I have more experience with that, everyone who went to veterinary medicine school got rabies vaccinated. And what we say is you got your vaccines from vet school, future, you're going to get a titer pulled to see if you still have that at least vaccine response in the future. We can do that for our dogs as well. So that idea of, do you still have that response to that vaccine from when you were vaccinated before? Okay. Yeah. Um, here's a note to Gael. Um, write a question on what you think wasn't covered and I will get that to Dr. Ropsky, okay? Yeah, definitely. An hour later, but now would be good. Um, here's another one about nighttime vocalizations and how we can help reduce it. Mm -hmm. What I would say is that's nighttime vocalizations is one of my more common presenting complaints. So I would say first and foremost, want to look into that pup's comfortability. Is there something that's causing them to be uncomfortable that they cannot settle in and get into a good position at night? Is there something that is triggering that vocalization outside of the home? So I think of noises outside. I also think of the clicking on and off of the heat or the air conditioning. So that can certainly be a cause of anxiety for my pups during certain times. I will say when I think about the various things from a specific cognitive dysfunction standpoint, we already talked a bit on melatonin. I've had melatonin help some of those pups. I spoke a bit about CBD helping some of my pups in that regard. Certainly options. If I reached for that selegiline, again, that idea of can I keep you awake more at night and help you or during the day, sorry, and then help you sleep a bit more at night, might that be an option? So Think about it from a pain discomfort standpoint, anxiety standpoint, and also cognitive dysfunction standpoint. Do I need to reach in and start to, you know, supplement, modify, adjust? I will say can sometimes be helpful for my dogs to have a place that they go to sleep at night and almost have, think of a nighttime routine for a young child. We do the same thing every single night before you go to bed can be helpful for our dogs to have that as well. That idea of, okay, you're going to get your dinner. We're going to go out and potty at this time. I'm going to put you in your bed or help you get to your bed at this time of night. And then you're going to be in your safe space at night that way. So sometimes even that can help, but I would say that one is one of my tricky ones where it's common and there can be a lot of different things that factor into it. Okay. Um, any suggestions on activity to avoid weight gain for dogs with chronic pain? Yes. I would say one of my best things to do is walking. So thinking about low impact activities. So walking, swimming is great. One of the things that I find is, is helpful for some folks. If you've got in your neighborhood, a, a road or a sidewalk with a slight incline, so I'm not thinking of something where like I'm going up a big gigantic hill, but a slight incline, that can be something that's helpful. So thinking about all of these lower impact activities are going to be better for dogs with joint disease than go run a mile. Lower impact is going to be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you do anything special with an aging dog that has been taking meds for seizures? She has a couple seizures a year. 
Mm -hmm. huh. What I would say is any dog that has seizures and is on medications, I am always cautious with what I layer in or don't layer in purely from a standpoint of sometimes various medications or less commonly supplements. I'm thinking more medications. They don't necessarily either play well with seizure medications or sometimes they can alter that seizure threshold. So what I would say in that instance is chat with your primary care veterinarian about what would be potentially safe to add in and what we could potentially cautiously layer in one at a time to not be worried about, okay, which thing is causing which problem if we saw a change there. So I would say I'm more cautious with my seizure patients than I am with some of my other dogs, but it's a good conversation to have if we can improve that pup's quality of life. Okay, Jennifer's question, I'm not 100% sure what she's asking, but you, okay. need, you know, figure it out. Um, my dog has a very complex medical history. How do you determine where to fit behavior treatments in with his care plan for chronic medical issues? Mm, that is a great question. And honestly, what I would say is if there is a say that we are concerned about behavior or behavior changes. That's where I would say having a consult with a boarded behaviorist or resident is going to be a great option for you because quite literally before every consult that I do, I comb through my pup's medical history to make sure that there's not something that either I need to be worried about, it's affecting behavior, but also anything that I'm going to be layering in, I don't want to cause a problem in that regard. So if your pup is a bit more on the complicated side, that's where I would reach out for that person that specializes in behavior to make sure that we're going down that, that right path. That's what I would say in that regard. Yeah. Anne has asked, as a dog ages, should we transition them to brain health food and or supplements as a preventative measure, or mm. should we wait and see if we see a problem? Honestly, great question as well. I would say it's never a bad idea to transition our pups to senior diets or brain protection blend diets or layering in supplements if if we, if we are worried or if they're say, example, large breed dogs and getting joint disease or having arthritis or having a harder time, I get a little bit more worried about that. So it's that idea of, I never have a problem layering things in before there's a problem to potentially prevent. I would say, as long as your pup isn't on a, another diet that they need for allergies or for GI sensitivities or anything like that. I will say great example, my own pup, we'll talk about Sadie, she's near and dear to my heart. She's been on joint supplements since she was about two because she has some early signs of hip dysplasia. We're using that as a preventative so that I can hopefully avoid a hip surgery for her in the future. But that idea of, I don't want to wait until something's a problem before I reach for it. And that idea of, not every pup might get diagnosed with cognitive de decline, cognitive dysfunction, but might they have some subtle signs of those aging changes where more of those general diets supplements could be helpful? Certainly. Denise wants to know if you could send the list of supplements that you suggested. I definitely can. Yeah. What I can do is I can, um, I can compile them and I can send them over so that y'all have them. Yeah. And I can put the diets on there as well. Okay, great. If you yeah. send them to me, we send a follow-up and we can include that in the follow-up. Certainly. Yep. I can definitely take care of that for us for sure. Let's see. Oh, somebody asked how they can make a donation. Yay. Answered that one. Remember everyone. It'll help support the webinars if you do donate. Um, uh, let me see. Is there a difference in the DISHAA for cats? Ah, great question. And I feel like that is a Oh, gosh, it's a whole nother topic that I find super interesting. So I would say with cats, I will use a similar form 
as the, I will use a similar form to the disha as the dogs. I will say that cats are, obviously they're a little bit different. They're always a little bit different. Mine actually meowed a couple times during this. So hopefully he didn't come across too strongly. Kitty cats, I would say things that I think of are, they are much more of my vocalizers at night. I will say cats, their biggest concern that is, is more apparent to me is changes in hygiene and changes in appetite. So think about how much our cats groom themselves during the day. Those cats that maybe have more unkempt hair coats or maybe they are not as, they're just not as clean as they used to be in their younger years. Sometimes that can be a sign of, is my body uncomfortable? Can I not get to that position to clean as well as I would like? Is there something going on from a medical standpoint that causes my hair coat to not be as shiny and glossy as it used to be? Or is there a slowing down of that cognitive function there. I will say we know more about dogs than we do about cats, but it is certainly coming more into light about cats and their, their aging. It's definitely something that we are thinking about more so. I would say the other thing we have to think of for cats, less of our dogs are using indoor litter and toileting options. Cats benefit from lower sided litter pans so that they don't have to jump into a gigantically tall litter box. So lower sided litter pans so that they can just walk in can be helpful. And then think about your orientation of your litter box. So where is it in the house? Does your cat have to climb down three flights of stairs and go into the laundry room to get to the litter box? An older cat might not be able to do that. Do I need to think about having a litter box more apparent on different floors of the house? But yeah, there, there are definitely some differences in, in cats. And honestly, that's a whole nother lecture topic that we could, we could talk for hours about cats. <laughs> okay. Um, what about a dog that approaches and asks both its, with its, both its body and paw for attention and petting, but then snaps and bites when he is petted? Could that be CDS? Mm, great question. And I would say I'd, I don't want to see that behavior in person. Obviously don't want to you know, cause anyone distress or anything like that. From what I hear is sounds like there might be some soliciting of attention. And is that true soliciting? Does that dog actually want that interaction? Or are they just investigating? So our pups are very much an investigating species. Sometimes I'm just coming to see what's going on and to smell and I don't necessarily want to be touched. Might I also think about it from a standpoint of, is that dog coming over not wanting to be touched? We as human perceive that they want to be touched and we touch and that dog is uncomfortable and says, mm -mm, that's not what I wanted. I didn't want that. Or is there a component of I'm a bit disoriented? Maybe I didn't want that that interaction to happen. So I would say in those cases, I almost describe it as playing hard to get. So if you have this previous experience of your pup coming towards you, and you reaching out and petting, and they have a history of reacting with any form of aggression, I would say, hands in your lap, play hard to get. Don't interact unless you have a confirmed, yes, I really want to interact, especially with that history. I would be more concerned about whether that dog actually wants that petting to occur. Okay, here is a question that I love. <laughs> From a rescue shelter perspective, we often get in older dogs and may not have a lot or any historical information. Any tips on how to assess these pups? Any suggestions on how to prepare potential owners? Yeah, I would say biggest thing for my dogs that we don't know medical history on, I'm going to think of thorough physical exam and probably some blood work to make sure that everything is in tip top shape before I think about adopting them so that we can set our adoptive pet parents up for success as much as possible. If we can let them know ahead of time, yeah, this pup's shoulder hurts or yeah, this pup's liver values are elevated they can know ahead of time and at least plan accordingly that that pup might need some, some extra care moving forward. I would say that, you know, certainly as adoptive pet parents, if we're adopting an older pet, we know that they might come with some challenges. I would also think about in those various settings, 
setting that pup up for success to put their best paw forward. Does that mean maybe you're not in the hustle and bustle of an adoption event and maybe you have a quieter space further off to the side or do you do one-on-one -on -one interactions to see what that owner might, might want to find out from that pet that maybe they wouldn't show us in a big hustle and bustle setting. I would say any of those general home environment modifications could certainly be applied to any older pet. Of course, not every older pet needs every supplement or medication under the sun, but can some of those more general strategies help anyone? Sure. Okay, what are the best enrichment activities for a dog who is mostly blind and deaf and also has very few teeth? Ah, I would say that's where I would reach for a snuffle mat. Honestly, that would be one of my go-tos. Or if your pup is comfortable outside, you could certainly sprinkle kibble or other treats in the yard and let them sniff. I would say if we're having some other sensory difficulties, I would reach for that sniffer for sure. Um, the question is at what age do you recommend starting dogs on preventative for joint issues? You said that you started Katie pretty young. Yeah, and the reason that we started our girl younger when I was working in the surgery service I had our surgeon put hands on her early on and we felt a little bit of looseness in her hips. So I would say it's there's no contraindication. So there's no reason to not to start a supplement younger. Sometimes it can be a financial burden for some of my owners. My girl has insurance, so it's less of a concern for me, hence why we started her so young. But I would say that's always a conversation to have with your veterinarian. So that idea of at what age do I start it is a great question for, for your veterinarian, especially if they're seeing anything on physical exam where they would say, yep, I would definitely do it. And here's why. Unless I'm missing something, I think we've made it through all the questions and they were great questions. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, they really were. And I mean, honestly, Deborah, if anyone has something that they're wanting to follow up after the fact, you're more than welcome to shoot them over to me in an email. Happy to answer them. Uh, is your email on this? No. Um, it's not. Email? Yeah, I would say if you've got my email, so I would have them send it to you. And then you can send them to me just because it will okay. be one where a little bit more challenging in, in that regard. And I don't want to, huh, I worry about my personal email getting out there because I use that to talk with you. So we'll have them send them to you first and you shoot okay. me any questions that they have. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We can do that. And I want to thank you. This was an excellent presentation. Everyone is saying that in chat and you gave out a lot of really good information. So thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. I'll you are so very welcome. Happy to do it. Okay, great. Enjoyed it. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.